Mayhemmedia.com. So I'm doing my impression of my horrendous drawing here. The idea though is this drawing by the end of this video will become ex incredibly helpful for you, not only in understanding more about how your body works, but more importantly, how you need to fix it or start thinking about how to fix it if it ever breaks down. And if you're training, most likely the way you're training these days is probably leading to more breakdowns than it might be to building you actually up. And that's not a good thing, but this is just sort of the trend that we've seen in training these days and breakdown is happening all over the place. So what I want you to see is I've listed a bunch of joints on the board here. And I basically started at the foot and I worked my way up the major joints. And there's going to be a pattern that you're going to see that's established here between the relationship of one joint to the next. I'm going to point that out in a second. But the first thing you should really kind of find cool is that when we're sort of developing as little cells originally in the body, before we become developed adults and before we even become babies, we start off sort of folded upon itself. When that cell starts to split and open up, it's basically opening up a mirror image, top and bottom, right lower body, upper body, of itself. So that you see joints that function very much the same. Your ankle is really kind of a reflection of your wrist. It's the, it's the lower body version of your wrist. And therefore, your calves are kind of like your forearms. They kind of do the same thing. And then down here, you've got your quads and your, and your legs, right? Your legs are just like your arms. So the quads will extend the legs, or extend the knee. The, the uh, triceps will extend the elbow here. So there's a lot of reflection going on uh, top to bottom, which makes it really uh, easy to understand this next point, that we have mobile and stable joints. Okay, A joint is usually, except for two big cases that are already outlined here, and I'm going to point them out, usually has a role of either being mobile or stable. What I mean by mobile, is it's there sort of to it's there to give you motion. You really want those joints to provide as much motion as they can to help you to move properly. The stable joints aren't meant to necessarily bind down and prevent motion altogether. Their main role is to be able to control mobility or to control the motion at that joint in the face of mobility from other joints around it. So here's how it all plays out. When you look down here and you start the toes, you ask yourself whether it's a mobile or a stable joint. And the main thing is that the toes need to be mobile. Those things need to be able to move. And when they don't, I'll tell you in a second here how it actually winds up compromising a lot of other uh, areas and creating injury. But that's a mobile area. The, the midfoot is the area right sort of, again, yeah, I um, can't see my foot here, but the midfoot is that area sort of right in through here, that reflection of the hand, right? That needs to be more stable. That area of the foot is a stable area because it needs to be able to, as I defined it just a second ago, kind of control the, the motion at that joint when you're running, when you're jumping, when you're doing a lot of other things. It needs to provide some stability. Your ankle, though, that needs to be mobile. So your mobile ankle needs to provide you with enough motion. If it doesn't, things break down, especially things when you squat. People who lack ankle mobility wind up having problems. The knee is a pretty stable joint. There's nothing really going on at the knee. It's a hinge joint, guys. There's not a lot of motion there. It should be a pretty stable joint. The hip, on the other hand, yes, it's a mobile joint. It's a ball and socket joint, but it's also a stable joint. Remember I said in the very beginning here, how I point out the two areas that sort of need to be mobile and stable. They kind of have a dual role. Well, it's the two that are really similar. It's the hip, it's the, it's the, the hip ball and socket and the shoulder ball and socket, but for the most part, it's a mobile joint. Then you get back into the lumbar spine. You want stability of the lumbar spine. If you don't have stability there, that's when you're going to get breakdown. And I'll explain again all these in a second. Just get the idea here of we have stability here. Sorry. Mobile, stable. Thoracic spine, mobile. Got to be able to move here. Most people can't move in their thoracic spine. That causes a lot of problems. Scapular thoracic joint, the ability to, ability to keep your scapula in place on your rib cage as you move your arm up. That needs to be mobile. I'm sorry, stable. That needs to be stable. We know that stable joints here are really hard to find because people have all kinds of things going on with their uh, scapula. They have winging scapula. They have tilted scapula. They have all kinds of problems there. Back up to the up here again. We want mobile because we've got that ball and socket joint again. But we also want it to be stable for reasons I'll explain in a second. Back into the elbow, like the knee, we want that to be stable. Then we've got our wrist. We want the wrist, like the ankle, to be mobile. And then you got the mid-carpal. You want that to be stable. And then you want your fingers to be mobile. Right? You can figure this out pretty much yourself. But look what happens when you look at the pattern here, obviously. 
Mobile, stable, mobile, stable, mobile, and stable. Stable, mobile, stable, mobile, and stable. Stable, mobile, stable, mobile. It's an alternating pattern of all of these, and there's good reason for that. Because in order to have a stable joint, it's got to have that motion, the mobility around it. And the same thing, in order to control the motion from those mobility, you know, the, the joints that are supposed to be mobile, you need to have a stable joint somewhere to be able to rein it all together. But when we look at what goes wrong, we can talk about, like I said in the beginning, even at the toes, if you lack mobility in your toes, you might get a compromised midfoot, an injury to the midfoot. A lot of football players that I train will undergo, uh, and, and, and will suffer an injury called a Lisfranc sprain. And that's a pretty damaging injury to the midfoot. And it's really because the midfoot was trying to be stable. And when the midfoot had to contribute or sacrifice some of its stability to the toes that were supposed to be mobile but aren't, guess what happens? That stable joint becomes less stable and it breaks down and it causes injury, right? If that toes aren't mobile enough, and it's really actually a serious problem, your toes, especially your big toe, better be damn mobile. And the problem with a lot of football players is they get really arthritic in their toes and they lack motion there. Well, if it doesn't get the motion from there, guess what? It's going to find it somewhere else, and it's going to grab it from the next joint up. And when it does and it reaches for that mobility and a joint that's supposed to be stable, that's when things go wrong. And maybe you can't appreciate that because you never sprained your midfoot before and you don't really know what that's like. But I can tell you how many of you watching have had a knee injury. That's a stable joint. That's supposed to be a stable joint. Okay, but it can be influenced, as I said, by those mobile joints above and below it. What if you don't have mobility in your hip? What if you don't have mobility in your ankle? When you're going down to a squat and you can't get down because you have no mobility in your ankle, guess what happens? The knee says, well, I'll try to give it to you. If I can, I'll give it to you. I'll, I'll, I'll bend more from my knee. You put all that pressure on the front of your kneecap and the patellar tendon, you get a lot of problems in your knee. But guess what? It's not the knee's fault in the first place. It's the fact that your ankle didn't have the mobility and the dorsiflexion to be able to allow you to go down and allow that knee to stay where, it, where it's supposed to be, instead it starts to travel forward more. So you're blaming your knee, but your knee's not to blame. What's to blame is the fact that you have no mobility in a, mobi in, a, in a joint that's supposed to be mobile. And the same thing can be said here for the hip. And the same thing here, when you have a lumbar spine breakdown, a problem with the lumbar spine, normally it's just trying to help the hell out. If it says, hey, well the hip isn't really mobile enough, so I'll help out. So you get all this motion going on through the lumbar spine, all this, this motion that's not supposed to be there. The lumbar spine is not supposed to move that much. But because it knows that it needs to get to where you need to do, where, where it needs to be to be able to perform whatever lower body move you're doing, it's going to sacrifice some of its own stability, becoming mobile. That's a problem. It starts to break down when really what you should have done was make sure that you had the mobility in the hip to begin with. So the answer is not to run out and mobilize everything. That's people's approach these days. They hear mobilization, mobility drills, it's kind of these buzzwords, they think it's the greatest thing in the world. It's not the greatest thing in the world. Sometimes you've got to work on stability and not mobility, the direct opposite of what people will tell you to do. I did point out the last thing here is that some joints, these two in particular, your shoulder and your hip, need to be able to benefit from both mobility and stability. Okay? I talked about a few of the instances already where mobility, a lack of mobility, will cause those other areas that are supposed to be stable to give in some of their stability to help out. But it also needs to be stable too. I've seen so many people, athletes especially, but really just gym rats, who lack stability in their shoulders. Yeah, they lack mobility too. We know that. People can't move their shoulders, especially internal and external rotation, the way they should. But then even when they get the mobility there, you go and you start doing a bench press. And you can't stabilize your shoulder blades. You can't stabilize your shoulder itself. And what happens is it starts moving all around as you're trying to bench and you are asking for a problem. The other day I did a video on dips and how it's important to have stability in through your shoulders as you do that exercise, not just to protect your chest, but to actually get more out of it. If you haven't seen that video, you got to watch it. Right here, I'll, I'll, I'll put a link to it. This is the video about how to actually do dips by maximizing stability of your shoulders and I'm telling you, way more effort being done by the pecs and therefore growth and, and value out of the exercise by doing it. So this is a whole big ass mess of my bad drawing, but the idea is simple is that you have to start thinking, understand how your body actually is set up and how it works. Understand that not everything is meant to be mobilized. Understand that when something does go wrong, you don't want to look necessarily right at the source of that 
problem, but you want to start looking above and below and figuring out where it is that you're in trouble. Because once you know that, then there's a lot of things you can do to try to fix that long term. And as a physical therapist, that's sort of my specialty, but I at least got to get you to start feeling like you can diagnose your own injuries and, and issues so that you at least have a better idea of how to start honing in on what's wrong. All right? So hopefully you found this helpful. If you did, leave your comments uh, about it and your thumbs up below. In the meantime, if you're looking for a training program that, like, that puts the science back in strength, I know this could be a little bit overwhelming, but it's not meant to be that. It's meant to just give you the idea that we know what we're doing here at Athlete X. I, I, I sort of pride myself on not being the average YouTube guy. Okay, I, I, could, I don't need to be a YouTube guy. I want to be here to be an educator and be a, a resource for you guys that want to take training seriously. We got our training program over at athletex.com that puts training, puts the science back in strength and takes training seriously. You can get your hands on that by going to athletex.com. In the meantime, again, like I said, if there's another issue you want me to talk about and sort of add the PT angle to it, let me know and I'm glad to do that here for you guys uh, to the best of my ability. All right, I'll talk to you guys again real soon.